Hey, morning everybody, or afternoon, or evening, or wherever it is, wherever you are. Um, apologies for my voice, I've got a bit of a cold from being on a plane too much. So the, the agenda for today is pretty jammed. Um, so there's uh, the Hackfest planning, um, and a reminder about the, the hackathon uh, this weekend, uh, not this weekend, next, next weekend. Um, we've got a work group charter discussion, I think. I thought I saw a link in the... Uh... Yep. I'll, I'll drop it in the window at the time. Well, okay. Yeah. Okay. So we've got a work group uh, charter discussion for requirements, and um, I think Oleg is on. Is that right? Yes. Hello. Good morning. Nice. Okay. Um, then uh, we have a quick um, sort of closure on the whole Slack archive repository thought. Um, uh, some internship discussion on uh, the various proposals that um, the, uh, the sub team sort of pulled together. Um, we've got a request to exit incubation for Hyperledger Fabric. And then Tomas is going to have, um, he's going to uh, present uh, the global sync log um, proposal, I think, although I haven't seen uh, a document. Tomas, are you ready for that this week as well? Yes, yes, I do. Okay, good, good. All right. So, any any other items? If not, let's uh, let's start with the hackfest planning. So, Todd. Yep, uh, we'll move quickly through things today. Uh, so we completed the Doodle poll. Uh, the most, uh, the date with the most availability for everyone is the week of April twenty fourth. Uh, we are targeting the East Coast. We are chatting with a few uh, different companies between Boston and New York uh, to finalize on venue space. But it will be the week of April twenty fourth, uh, likely a Tuesday, Wednesday, or a Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, hopefully, we'll have something uh, confirmed by next week, uh, so we can get people's travel planned. We're still about eight weeks out, so still have a good amount of time. Uh, still looking at June uh, to do a Hackfest in Beijing uh, around LinuxCon China. Uh, more, de more details to come there. And if you have venue space for either of these or are interested in potentially hosting, please get in touch with me as soon as possible. Thanks. Super. Thank you. OK, next up, uh, any, any questions, I guess, before we move on? No, OK. So next up is Oleg, and we have a, a link to the requirements work group proposal, charter proposal. There we go. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Oleg. Um, well, first of all, uh, many thanks to Clive Bolton uh, and um, um, this is um, this is a result of about two weeks of uh, of discussion. Um, the main point of, uh, of the charter is that the requirements working group uh, is a forum uh, for business domain experts, architects, and technologists, uh, where we just uh, exchange ideas, uh, discuss requirements, and uh, derive additional features uh, for uh, technologies in the uh, Hyperledger project. Um, the requirements working group also provides uh, recommendations to the projects. Um, um, the scope um, of the requirements working group um, is mainly um, an inventory of um, requirements documents that capture uh, specific use cases in the industries uh, uh, that we focus on, um, and a high-level um, list of features and recommendations that we uh, deliver to the architecture group. Um, we collaborate with other groups. Uh, the process of the requirements working group uh, is that the, uh, this forum is open to everyone in the Hyperledger community. Um, we run a wiki page, um, a rocket chat uh, channel, and the email list. We also meet bi-weekly on the WebEx call and uh, discuss use cases and uh, uh, whatever the agenda. Um, uh, well, that's about it. It's, uh, it's two pages of, um, of the charter. Um, Everyone is um, uh, free to uh, make suggestions to it. Um, I'll run uh, a formal uh, vote on this um, on this document on March sixth when we meet next time. Uh, but I think the draft is pretty much complete. And uh, unless any other uh, suggestions are made, we'll uh, we'll close it uh, uh, this coming Monday. Okay. 
So, um, uh, any any questions or comments from TSC? Or is, this a, is this the draft that the working group is submitting to the TSC for approval, or is this a draft you're inviting for comments that the working group will then finalize and then come back to the TSC for final approval? Um, well, um, uh, the second option. Um, okay. It's still, still in a I don't, I don't mean to be overly bureaucratic. I'm just, uh, you know, right. the TSC is what kind of approves you know, the charters for each of the working groups. Exactly. So, um, so well, we'll close the draft on Monday after, uh, you know, formally everybody uh, votes on this in our group. Right. And then I'll deliver it to the TSC so the TSC can make suggestions or uh, approve or disapprove it. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully it can be approved next week. Um, I think uh, on the disbanding note at the very bottom, um, I, I see this, the need for this working group as kind of ongoing um, and, and persistent. Uh, uh, you know, like there will always be new use cases worth considering. There will always be new um, uh, releases of the different technology projects within Hyperledger that are worth mapping to those use cases. Um, uh, and so, uh, do you see it the same way, um, or do you think um, that there's a, a fixed time frame for this working group? Yes, I do. I do. I don't think that we should disband any time. I think it's uh, uh, the forum should be uh, kept open. Um, but um, uh, yeah, so uh, I'll discuss it again with uh, our members, see if we can uh, drop this uh, disbanding clause. I think it's okay. good to drop. Um, yeah, I, I tend to agree, Brian. I think this, you know, this is one of those that just sort of there's always new requirements um, until the technology becomes obsolete, I guess. The last, which is when the last user is dead, right? Or so. Um, so uh, the, the one comment I had was on the collaborations. I think it would be, and, and, and Brian, you know, we, we chatted sort of obliquely about this earlier this morning, but I think we need to figure out a way that we can engage the requirements working group with some of these sort of industry-specific work groups like healthcare and others that may come down the pike. What, do, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I agree. I think I, I think that's where um, uh, our working groups actually overlap. The, uh, the financial working group and the uh, the healthcare group. Um, uh, yes. I don't know okay, if we should. Adding, um, all the... adding some. I think some, adding some mention of the relationship to that, to those industry-specific working groups to this charter would be nice. Um, I don't want to overburden this group because um, I do want the, the, these industry-specific groups, starting with healthcare, to also carry some weight in helping define these use cases. But if they knew that there were experts in helping, you know, craft these use cases and mapping them to the, the technology products at Hyperledger, um, and that would be great, right? So uh, some verbiage about that connection would be would be nice. Yep. Hi, okay. this is Leonard Dice. Good morning. I think that's a great idea because there are some industries we can um, prioritize in terms of understanding the requirements and ensure that we are fully aware of what feature sets that blockchain should provide for some of these vertical industry sectors. So that's that's wonderful going forward. So Any if, other if I'm remembering, comment? I'm sorry, Dan. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just saying if, if I was remembering right near the uh, near the outset of Hyperledger, um, I think it was it was with this working group. It seemed there was a reluctance from some of our industry partners to provide use cases because there was a perception those were um, valuable as intellectual property within within each company. Uh, and a lot of those use cases or, or requirements really weren't forthcoming. Does that feel like that's still uh, an issue today? And is there something that we can do with with updating the charter of the working group to help address that? Well, um, it's kind of hard to say. I mean, whatever I guess remained a secret um, a year later still remains a secret. But uh, I think now we have uh, we have a set of uh, canonical use cases. Uh, perhaps what we are missing uh, uh, maybe some measurements or some real numbers that can help um, the requirements. I guess those those two remain a secret. Yeah, Dan brings up um, a, a good and interesting point. I think 
and I like to your point on sort of coming up with some some metrics. Um, you know, sometimes what it takes for people is to see, oh, look, you know, this use case has been published and people are building solutions around it and they're still monetizing it and so forth, and nobody died, right? Um, and, and maybe we need to to be highlighting some of those things. Um, I, I, you know, I mean, do we? Do we want to put something in here in the in the charter, or maybe is that just a function, maybe of you know when we come across something interesting that we've got documented that someone was willing to share, but yet you know is starting to re you know achieve broad adoption or something that we can just sort of highlight that in a blog post or something just to raise awareness. I don't know, Brian. What do you think? I think it's going to be important to show um, a round trip. Um, eventually between the inputs into this process, you know, the definition of these use cases and requirements, and ultimately at some point how one can <coughs> deliver deliver those with with the technologies at Hyperledger. And it may be that it's, you, you can't, you know, get it out of the box, <laughs> you know, hey, we need a, uh, you know, derivatives trading market. Um, well, you know, there's still some work to do building on top of any of the uh, underlying technologies to implement that. but. But something that shows, okay, the, the, these use cases drove these specific requirements, and those requirements were implemented as of, you know, Fabric 1.0, you know, Sawtooth 1.0, that sort of thing. Um, that's that I think is going to incent people to to create more of these, right, and to feel like their contribution was worthwhile. I think the biggest concern I'd have is this repository of use cases and requirements um, feels like shouting into the wind, right? Um, uh, so that's, I think, I think an, an urgent. I think that's an important thing to add to the charter, to to address those concerns. Hi, this is Vipin. Um, coming from the industry perspective, um, there was there has been a movement in the direction that you desire, which is um, people people uh, first thought, oh, these are all intellectual property. Uh, but the point of the blockchain itself is collaboration. So uh, we have been trying to educate the business uh, users here internally that unless you share some of these, then you're not going to develop common platform, common solutions. That is the first thing. Uh, the second thing is in terms of the requirements work group, could we also add, I mean, maybe not in the charter, but in the uh, description of the use case, uh, any examples of, uh, you know, like Brian was just saying, the round trip phenomenon. Any examples of uh, actual uh, implementations that are available in a, in a sort of a, as a common um, place to go to to see how much we have progressed. Uh, with with implementing uh, requirements. That's all from me. All right. Thanks, Vipin. Um, so we have, like I said, we have a, a jam-packed uh, topic, uh, a set of topics, I should say, uh, agenda today. So I think um, this has been great input. And so if anybody else has input for Oleg and the requirements work group, um, please, um, you know, use chat or email to share that with the requirements working group and um, uh, I think we should probably move on. So thanks again, Oleg, and again, I think this is a great uh, a great start as a couple of people have mentioned. Thank you. Um, and um, I forgot to mention um, a Bart Kant who helped a lot with this document and Clyde Bolton. So thank you. Thank all you. right. Thanks. Okay. Very quickly, um, you know, so Rai put together an archive of all of the Slack discussions, I think, you know, we were going to sort of noodle on, do we need this? Do we need to sort of uh, pair it off? Uh, here's what I would suggest. I, I, I didn't hear anybody say, oh, we shouldn't keep these because there could be some gems in here. I think the, the real challenge comes in how do, you, um, uh, how do you make it presentable, right? And so I would just suggest that we, um, uh, you know, unless anybody has strong a difference of opinion that we sort of put it as an action for um, uh, I guess me and Rye to figure out how are we going to make it presentable 
you know, whether we host it in Nexus or something like that as HTML, um, and um, and then and just sort of move on from here. Because again, I think there's there's probably good information here. We just need to surface it, make it searchable. So other than just sort of raw text form of HTML. Yeah, I think as valuable as the information is, it probably uh, starts to expire more and more over time. So I wouldn't uh, wouldn't encourage Rye to uh, over overwork himself getting something out there. But it would be nice if it was uh, accessible. Yeah. Any other thoughts on this? Any objections? Mick, were you going to weigh in? No. Okay. Hey guys, All right. I, this was Greg. I, I, uh, I had a, a, another call come in for 30 seconds. But is this still the conversation about the working group, or did you move on to the next topic? We're on the Slack archive, um, Greg. Oh, gotcha. And, but we uh, agreed you do all the work for the requirements that's right. work group. That's the action. Yeah. Awesome. All right, so I'll, I'll take that with Rye, and, and we'll drive that to some sort of conclusion. Um, internship program. Uh, so we have a, a few proposals that made it through the through the cut. Um, to Todd, do you want to, or somebody want to present this? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, so we had uh, twelve mentors um, apply uh, it, with project proposals uh, that we will then have interns apply to. We needed to narrow this down to a total of six based on budget. So a subgroup um, met earlier this week to talk through the different proposals and wanted to make sure that it was a, a diverse set across geography, across company, across projects, uh, etc. And so it. Uh, the group narrowed it down to the following six. Um, so they're listed on the slide for everyone to take a look at. They were also included in the agenda last night. Um, and so really what we're looking for from the TSC is, uh, are there any objections to moving forward with this as the recommended six? Uh, if not, we will get this posted to our internship portal and start promoting the internship program so that students can begin applying. So for for the TSC members on the call or anyone else, uh, any questions or any any objections to moving forward with this? I think this is a solid list. Great. Yeah, we're we're really happy with uh, uh, the proposals and uh, mentors that came in. So it's good good first year for Hyperledger. Yeah, it'll be great it'll to be, get uh, these uh, out there uh, with. with the uh, I think some of the students that I've interacted with, they're already deep into their their summer plans. So the sooner we can get this out, the better. Yeah, agree. I see that two of them involve uh, um, mentors who are based in China. Uh, would we try to match up uh, mentor uh, students uh, in China with those with those two projects? We can, um, but it's not required. Uh, so much of the work that we do is virtual that. Um, they don't need to be based in China, but yeah, we will certainly take applicants from there. Great. All right. Well, I I I hear a lot of plus ones, plus twos. Uh, any anybody disagree with uh, going forward with this list? Well, I disagree that we should. <laughs> <laughs> that we we should all agree to go forward with this. Okay, I think that. Uh, sorry, but no, I think it's a, a splendid list. Um, it's well representative of all the different industry groups and corporations, as um, someone said earlier. And um, given the twelve and the, the six we determined here, I think this is the best we could have done. We took all those. <laughs> Thank you, Todd, for putting this together and for the whole team for voting on this list. All right. Thanks, Lynn. Okay. I think we have agreement, Todd. Great. Super. Okay. Next up, request to exit incubation for Hyperledger Fabric. Um, Greg, uh, I'm sorry, Gary had sent out uh, an email um, 
uh, I think Tuesday of last week with um, a proposal to exit incubation. We didn't really have quorum last week. Well, I think we actually did achieve quorum, but a lot of a lot of people were absent. So I think um, you know I felt that we should probably put it off until we have a um, uh, a, a, a more solid quorum, if you will. Um, uh, Arno, I know you you helped to contribute to putting this together, so maybe you could uh, pitch in. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, so yes, uh, as you all know, we have defined a, a project life cycle for all our projects, and uh, all the projects today are in incubation. Fabric has been in that state for quite a while, over a year, almost a year and a half, I guess now. It's like, uh, and so the 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 maintainers have been looking into what it would take for them to be able to move the project from incubation to uh, active state, which is the next step. And uh, they actually documented in the document that has been pointed to and published to the mailing list the uh, the the list of criteria. As you may remember, we had a lot of discussion on this. This is not about the maturity of the product of the project, but of the project itself. So it has more to do with <clears throat> the way the project is organized and uh, whether they got their everything together and it's a functioning community. And uh, as the joke has been within the, the among the maintainers, is like, well, if there's one thing that's pretty clear is that the project is very active, practically speaking. So uh, there is actually one point which, if you look at the exit criteria one by one, and we've documented the, uh, how we believe the the project, you know, uh, addresses all the requirements. There is one that cannot be addressed today. It's the uh, alignment with the architecture. Uh, the, the architecture defined by the architecture working group. Uh, as you I'm sure you're all aware, the architecture working group is still working on this, so it's just impractical to you know define the alignment. But uh, you know uh, we hope that this would not be considered to be a, a showstopper. And uh, otherwise, you know I'm not going to go through all of those criteria. They've been posted. There's been an email sent. I haven't seen any comments or questions. There were several people I saw on the on the the chat uh, have you know expressed support for the uh, for the re request. Certainly, all the maintainers are excited about this, and they all agreed to do this. So it's up to the TSC now to decide whether they should be granted that or not. Thanks, Arno. Any questions, comments? Yes, this is Greg. Um, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. So, I think oh, so this is Greg. I was just going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> we need a consensus protocol. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I go saw. Go ahead, Vip, Greg. I think I saw Vipin, and then it was Greg, and then Mick. It, it, that's the way I saw the talking on the on the window here. So, it's Vipin. my turn. Then. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. I, I, um, just just real quick. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'll, I'll shut up. This is Greg. All right, a um, couple of points. One is, uh, even though the architecture working group document is not completed, some of the sections seem to be. Uh, so, um, you know, because I have a feeling the architecture working group document to be completed is going to take a take a while. Uh, and if if you have any comments at all on the sections that are you know together then that would be a great addition to this document um, that's first second is is there a uh, I mean I'm reading this document I haven't clicked on all the links uh, is there some notion I mean I know that Hart mentioned it several other others mentioned it that is more a uh, uh, a measure of the community that's behind this rather than the completeness of the uh, of the solution itself of 1.0 right. so is 1.0 out no no okay so this is this is a, again this is about exiting incubation we're still working towards our alpha release of 1.0 um, 
you know, we had, uh, I think we're pretty much sort of feature complete from, uh, you know, from the, 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 the list of things that, you know, we thought needed to be in the first release. Uh, the, the one st sticking point was we didn't really have a good bootstrap uh, tool, and you actually had to use the test uh, infrastructure to create a sort of a bootstrap for a network. And so we've, we've, you know, Gary is going through and he's, he's, he's rectified that, and we're working to get the, the various uh, SDKs and CLIs to align with this, um, this new uh, uh, tool to generate all the relevant crypto. Um, um, it, it, for for you know for bootstrapping a, a network you know a system uh, network and um, uh, but once we get that and um, uh, we have a couple of clean passes of builds then uh, I think we're going to cut an alpha so that's probably going to be this month um, and then we'll lather rinse and repeat on test fix test fix text you know until we're at you know sort of zero sub zero uh, set ones rather and uh, and then probably put a I want it. Uh, so next up was uh, I think Greg was in a car, and I think Greg, you were next. Oh yeah, uh, I just wanted to add uh, the question that I w it wasn't clear from the proposal is what the scope of fabric was, right? So there's. Obviously, there's the main Fabric Git repository, which is obvious, and, and there's a couple other projects that I think are implicit in that, like Base Image, for instance, and maybe the test resources. But I didn't know if that was in, also intending to include things like Chain Tool or Node SDK, and you know, if so, which ones are included or all of them, that, that kind of thing. Obviously, I would love to see Chain Tool included, but I don't know if it fully meets the criteria in terms of you know the number of people involved and all that stuff. So I, I wanted to talk about that. I mean, I, I think that so this is this is Chris, and I think that from a um, you know an alignment perspective, all of the repositories that say Fabric Dash something are aligned, and you know they're working towards uh, you know getting to to one and so I would think it would be all of the ones that say Fabric Dash something. All right, that makes sense. I just wasn't sure from the document if that's what was intended. Yeah, I mean obviously. <laughs> Yeah, I was just saying that quickly. This is a good point, Leonard here, that um, any release, whether it's um, an implementation just coming up or an incubation, should have a set of requirements, high-level requirements that we could map to that release. Uh, I, mean, this, I don't this think is this is the conversation that we're having right now. Right. Good. No, that's fine. Continue. Okay, so I think next was Mick and then Dan. I gotta find out which button I used to mute this time. Um, so uh, just a couple of things. One is that I wanted to give kudos to um, Gary and Arnaud for putting together a great document um, that describes the transition. Um, this this looks like a really good thing. Um, the the question you brought up in the document at one point about um, no single organization leaving that the project would continue. Um, what's your thinking about um, the ongoing role for IBM in this? Um, if you picked up, if IBM picked up and moved, would it continue on? Is it that mature? And what's your line of reasoning behind that? Um, so, I, so, so right now, right, we're we're driving towards, you know, my goal for, for last year was to try and get under 50% of the, cont uh, the, the contributors um, and, you know, to keep pushing down the total percentage of contribution um, of code. We're at a point where I think, and what did I, what, what do we put in here, um, 50, 55% uh, of the total contributors. I haven't checked this uh, week, this is a couple of weeks Old, you know, we keep gaining more contributors, um, and you know what I'm seeing is that we're getting more sustained contributors. Um, you know, as people start, you know, to use the uh, the, the the fabric um, and all the different uh, component, you know, constituent parts, um, and so you know, I, I, ideally, you know, we get we have to get down to about thirty percent. Um, 
of the total contributions and get others in, you know, sort of the 10 and 15 percent, you know, contribution le levels. Um, right now, you know, independents are sort of number two, and then we have some strong contributions, obviously, from Greg and State Street and from DTCC and, and Fujitsu and, and uh, uh, Hitachi and Huawei. Um, you know, if IBM were to walk away today, would it continue? Um, probably not. We're not going to. Um, uh, I have and, no doubt about that. You know, it's the, tra the trajectory that I'm, I'm looking more at. You know, we, we came from essentially 100%, you know, and, and you know, the numbers continue to drive down um, and to be much more uh, of a plurality than anything. In fact, we were very close to being under 50%. And then the drive to get to, you know, the V1 features all complete sort of bumped up our numbers a little bit, which from that, you know, from my perspective, it was good because we're getting, you know, people, more people playing, but it's also more IBMers. So, um, I mean, I, I think, you know, if, if I had to sort of characterize also the IBM contributions, it's, it's not all coming from one group. So it's not like if one group, just, I mean, you know, we have, uh, three or four different constituencies within IBM that are contributing to this from different parts of the business that each have an interest in, in this thing going forward. So, you know, even if, if, you know, Sharon Weed's team were to sort of walk away from this, I think it would still happen. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Dan, Dan. Yep, yeah. sorry, Dan. Um, uh, no, I, I just thought that it was a really well organized uh, request, and uh, I'm frankly surprised that uh, the Fabric team didn't didn't make that sooner. I think uh, you guys have done a good job organizing the the processes, and I, I don't actively uh, contribute on Fabric, but what I see from uh, from the outside is uh, processes are in place. You guys have. Uh, good reviews through Garrett, and it looks like mature uh, team and processes. So I think this is all good. Yeah, we we actually delayed a little bit. <coughs> sorry, we delayed a little bit the, putting the request forward because they were there was some uh, repos that had not been transitioned yet to from like uh, GitHub to Garrett, and then uh, the documentation was. In, real limbo for a while while we were working on 1.0 and so we just waited to get to a sense of more stability to make the request so I think we got there now and it's not to say that everything is perfect right I'm one of the most critical persons about you know sometimes not being open enough not transparent enough <laughs> having some of the documentation the decisions on 1.0 not full easy to find you know the the but I think we've definitely made some great progress there. And yeah, we'll I, I think that's a, a good point. Is that uh, part of the maturity there is is uh, that evaluation of of whether the team is doing the best thing? And I don't think anybody's ever expected that that a team is going to execute flawlessly. But uh, having a self-critical eye of that is, I think, a great thing. Right. Arno is our ombudsman. Our, our ombudsman. I can never say that. <laughs> Yeah, all, the other, all, yeah. <laughs> sorry, Ram Jagadeesan here. Um, so first of all, uh, uh, great document and great progress. Uh, I think uh, uh, we're definitely at the point where uh, this uh, th this needs to happen. Uh, in the alignment with the architecture work group, I know uh, you know uh, we're not there yet in terms of a well-defined architecture document, but I'd say you know I'm really happy with the progress. Uh, that the fabric team seems to have made in terms of moving um, in the directions that uh, uh, that the architecture working group is kind of uh, is going towards. So the first complete work item, uh, I would say, I mean, of course, it's an iterative process, but uh, it was a separation between the smart contract layer and the uh, ledger layer, and uh, it seems like that's been very clearly done uh, in uh, Fabric 1.0, uh, as well as the other major pushes going to a modular architecture with separation between the storage layer and so forth. Um, so I'm very encouraged to see that uh, that's happened in Fabric. Uh, so, uh, you know, perhaps that can be uh, captured. Bitten probably has a good idea of, uh, given his ongoing contribution to the architecture work group, 
uh, of, of what what of those uh, directions that we are pushing towards have uh, already happened in Fabric 1.0. Uh, so perhaps that can be kind of captured here as uh, um, as Bipin was also suggesting. Thanks, Rob. And there was somebody on the phone. I didn't. Uh, I can't tell who's on the phone, but somebody tried to get in same time as Rob. And Patty, it wasn't you. No. Uh, okay. Any so any other any other comments concerns? If not, I think Todd, we should put it to a vote. All right. Sounds good. Um, so walking through the list, uh, Arno. Yes. Dan. Yes. Chris. Yes. Dan. Yes. Greg. Yes. Hart. Yes. Mick? Yes. Richard? Uh, yes, yeah, so I didn't get to just speak earlier. So, yes, um, yeah, we're welcome to the team. Uh, let, let's, let's minute, from a completely self serving perspective, the, um, the discussion around um, IBM's long term intentions, even though the, the product, the, 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 the project, um, depends so much on them right now, because I may need to rest on exactly the same argument when Coda um, when comes through this in the future. <laughs> Otherwise, yes. Great. Uh, and Tomash? Yes. All right. And Morali, I don't think Morali joined, but if you're there. Yeah, yes. Yes, sir. Ah, okay, great. Uh, so that passes unanimously. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right. Next up is um, Tomash. And the GSL discussion. Hi. Thanks. Uh, Chris, I prepared a presentation which I would want to share. Um, I hope I have the right to do so. Tomasz, uh, you, you're very faint. I'm, uh, I, I just said that I am, shade, I, I am sharing my screen. Just give me a minute. Oh, okay. So I hope you see my screen now. Uh, I can see it, yes, thank you. Great. So uh, we promised a couple of uh, weeks ago to extend on our thinking of the GSL. And uh, this is, I, I'm, I heard that I'm very quiet. Let me try, try to fix my mic. I hope it is louder, louder now. So we promised to talk about uh, or extend the thinking of uh, the GSL, and um, this is uh, it, this comes forward now in the form of a presentation, not yet as a proposal as uh, Chris anticipated. Uh, I think that this proposal will build very well uh, the discussion uh, of such a proposal. And I won't do this presentation alone, but I would also include uh, my colleague, um, Lance Arlos, who is working as a product architect in Digital Asset. He was also uh, very instrumental in extending our thinking, so this is an honor to hand over to him so he can set the context of this presentation. Hello, everybody. I uh, hope everyone can, uh, can hear me. It's a pleasure to join you on the call today. Uh, Am I coming through okay? Just want to make sure. Loud and clear. Loud and clear, Lance. Awesome, great. Yeah, so as Tomas said, I want to set a, a little bit of context before we, uh, before we uh, get going here. And uh, I would say as a community, the original vision that we aspired to was to achieve an internet, internet of value transfer that uh, seamlessly spans markets and organizations. In other words, the free movement of assets with full fidelity and no settlement risk. Tomasz, uh, next slide. So the, the problems that we face in achieving that vision are in some ways unique, uh, but largely familiar, actually. 
So fragmentation is a natural byproduct. Uh, it's actually a healthy byproduct of the innovation cycle during its initial stages. But convergence and emergence of standards is necessary for broad-based adoption. This means practical solutions and uh, not some of the ones that require, for example, uh, everyone using the same distributed ledger or one ledger being the, uh, the prime authoritative legal record of ownership. Um, these ideas are unrealistic because they introduce new systematic or systemic risk in the financial system and potentially fundamentally change uh, market structures and regulatory oversights or regulatory oversight. And we don't want to stifle innovation in a young, rapidly evolving ind industry. So what we're looking forward to, or what we look for, for is, uh, next slide please. Uh, the, the notion of interoperability. So while our unique value proposition in the market is the potential to eliminate reconciliation, and that may sound trite, but reconciliation is the limiting factor of any distributed business process. So interoperability really kind of takes on a, a special meaning in our industry. And it's the ability to eliminate reconciliation and execute or orchestrate workflows across multiple different systems. In other words, eliminating reconciliation through automated convergence. And this is the foundation of some of the concepts that we're going to talk through uh, today. Tomasz? Um, you, you certainly remember uh, that we published a paper about uh, GSL a few months back. If you did not uh, read it yet, uh, you can use the link uh, given on that sheet. Um, I, if you're not familiar, I just very shortly recap. In this paper, we encouraged collaborative work in the hyperledger community towards creating a component of the technology stack that we think compromises the distributed ledger. Um, in this document, we identify that the fundamental requirement for the application of uh, DLT in regulated financial services was to preserve the privacy of sensitive, sensitive information. And uh, we concluded after analyzing several uh, alternatives that this is best uh, accomplished for by sharing uh, data only on a need to know basis. Uh, the consequence of this was to create uh, the creation of a component, which we call the GSL, uh, which is a, a, a log of commitments of confidential data and the notification set that uh, accompanies this evident, these evidence to confidential data. And the recipient of this, these notifications know then how that, what, what confidential data they are involved in and what they need to fetch. And uh, thereby, the, with, with, this, with this separation of, of concerns, we created a, 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 a distributed ledger consisting of, a, of, a, uh, of our platform that the GSL is a component of. The, the GSL basically establishes a common and complete set of wallet transactions and then combines it with the corresponding off-chain data. In our, um, in our implementation, uh, the GSL is um, responsible for uh, three, three different things. Once it is, for one, it is an arbiter of relative orders, it's sorting the transactions. It, is, it also ensures that uh, um, mutually exclusive events uh, do not happen. Uh, so it maintains the, the consistent state of the ledger data. And it also serves as an assured notification mechanism. So the stakeholder who is affected by a change of data um, will be notified and will know that there is something, something happened that is concerned of. In, in our current implementation uh, of the DA platform, this component, although it's a logically separate component, is embedded into the platform. And this was the main reason why we did not uh, open source it, because we uh, honestly did not have the, uh, the resources uh, and, and the, uh, the right uh, context to extract it as a, as a project of its own. Um, where, although we, although we uh, started with, with an embedded component, uh, the design, as we went on, uh, evolved into a more externalized service. And uh, this, is, this represents basically an evolution of our original design, um, as we described in the, that we described in the non-technical white paper. 
uh, that is much more versatile than uh, through this clean separation of, of responsibilities. We basically separate the, 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 the uh, a committer, uh, which you can think of as the maintainer of the state uh, within the within the the platform. Uh, the committer is uh, responsible for the local sequencing and caching of events, whereas uh, uh, the um, participants within the platform or participants uh, who are connected through the platform uh, get the notification of uh, changes of ledger state this, uh, the way we earlier described through the GSL. While we, <coughs> while we uh, extended it to, uh, into a kind of uh, standalone service, uh, we realized that this is also suitable to connect several instances of our platform. If, for example, two markets uh, would be run by two uh, distinct uh, providers, infrastructure providers, then uh, we could connect them uh, using a common GSL, uh, which would maintain, still maintain an independent state of the ledger on the two sides of the platform, but would allow uh, notifications across these platforms uh, using the same service. We could, uh, although we did not deliver this proof uh, from the concept, concepts of how this, uh, how we see this working, we believe that uh, uh, the workings of the GSL are even extensible to other platforms if they would implement the same type of uh, separation of responsibilities between a committer and a GSL compliant uh, um, interface to the services uh, I described. Uh, I, I would really emphasize here that this is about uh, GSL, com GSL compliant uh, services and not the GSL as a particular software. And the services, the utilities that such a GSL actually provides are quite simple. The, the uh, fourfold uh, one is to evidence uh, contracts in our case, or we would say uh, state objects in case of CODA or uh, the world state in case of fabric, you would evidence that with a cryptographic hash and uh, you would use notifications to let the other platform know about what's happened, that some, some evidencing happened. We have the GSL in between them uh, to distribute the data, whereas our, our goal is to minimize the broadcast information, even on the GSL level, and uh, to as much point-to-point -point transfer as possible. And finally, the GSL is also a, a storage component uh, for a self-contained, self-auditing app and only data. Now, <clears throat> every platform that we, we saw also in the Hyperledger Foundation, every platform has vendor-specific terms for, for pieces that uh, uh, this uh, such a, um, um, a GSL-compliant view of them would imply. Um, but they actually have very similar concepts. And work, uh, while, we, while we extended our thinking on, on the GSL, we came up with, uh, with some thoughts of a common terminology that might be useful for to consideration for other projects and also for the entire industry. And I would like to ask Lance to introduce us to this terminology. Yeah, thanks, Tomasz. Uh, so as, as I alluded to earlier, uh, if we put this into context in, in the just in the overall innovation cycle that we've seen uh, you know in both within our industry and other industries as well right we've come to a point where uh, you know the we have an opportunity to have convergence really so once we have some common knowledge about a domain uh, you know like I said we have the the prerequisites really to meaningfully collaborate if we start speaking some of the same language so this is not an attempt to uh, 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 get to the point where we eliminate differences, but rather for the fundamental components that, uh, that are common to the various different platforms, the fundamental concepts, if you will, that we map that them down to a common reference model that allow us to uh, progress towards a vision of interoperability. Uh, next slide. So distributed reference or distributed ledger reference model, 
is really a conceptual abstract framework that starts to identify and put common terms on some of the common pieces that we have throughout our, uh, our various stacks. So uh, some, a vendor neutral framework that we can map to vendor specific components and really serve as that uh, opportunity or, or the means to identify opportunities to collaborate and create cross-platform modular common components for interoperability. The model is based on a layered architecture with each layer having distinct responsibilities and that, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> yep, go ahead, Tomas. If you want, if you want to take it away. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for uh, being a bit too fast by paging. But, um, so I think that uh, the uh, the reference model that uh, Lance just mentioned um, is a, is is really a huge chance to align our uh, discussions and our thinking, and will probably also help us to. Um, to rethink or, or to map the structure of the current projects to something more common uh, and uh, interoperable, interoperable, at least on the conceptual level in the industry. Um, I think that the, 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 more, the, the projects that we currently see on um, in Hyperledger are, are naturally, because that's probably by nature of a new technology, uh, covering a bit higher scope than they need to be need, need to do, and uh, yeah, I think I, <laughs> I made my point, point. Um, and that's that's what that's why we are uh, we are very supportive of the of the idea of an umbrella organization of the uh, Hyperledger um, project uh, because we think that it, it would really make sense to to create components that would cut, cut across these. As we, we certainly see that uh, GSL type component as a minimum viable option to start with that kind of uh, um, modularization of the stacks. And uh, we, we, we think that this modularization has even further promises, uh, which I would ask Lance to elaborate on. Yeah, so similar to our own progression internally, uh, because when we started designing the GSL component, as Dimash uh, referenced, it really started as this embedded component. And we went through this design progression where going from an embedded component that can uh, coordinate uh, segregated ledgers internally within one distributed ledger to now an externalized service that can coordinate uh, across distributed ledgers, even within our own platform, what we realized is if you just take the next logical step, that that would be applicable to the community at large. Now I mentioned the first step to doing that, as it is in any industry, is developing a reference model, mapping uh, the various platforms to that reference model, and then once we have a service that, that can uh, uh, serve that reference model, by extension it can serve uh, the various platforms. So as Tomash mentioned, it, rather than starting uh, from the top down and doing full stack platforms and expecting to uh, somehow extract some modular components uh, out of those various platforms, really starting from the, from the bottom up and having a set of clearly defined responsibilities. And as I mentioned, the reference model is a layered architecture, which naturally starts to uh, translate or, or allow us to identify some of those opportunities for having common components at that base layer. And the base layer for the commitments and notifications, uh, you know, ostensibly would be a GSL or GSL-like component. So, offering an approach that has the potential to deliver interoperability through a common vendor-neutral service. Uh, you know, we're headed, we're clearly headed for a world of uh, a heterogeneous distributed ledger world. Uh, many different platforms, there will be a need for these platforms to interoperate. If we think of interoperability from the perspective of eliminating reconciliation, uh, we will start getting to the point of delivering on the true promise of, of, the, of the industry. To achieve this, like I said, we need, uh, you know, a common framework and starting at the lowest minimal common foundation uh, to start that, that journey, if you will, to interoperability. 
and Tamasha's going to talk about some of the you know specific deliverables along that along that uh, journey. Yeah. So I, I recognize that we we um, we incited uh, we we raised some big hopes and also made bold claims with this introduction. Um, in, in our thinking, this is well funded, and we would want to share this thinking uh, in the firm form of a, a reference model for distributed ledger, um, and, and and provide this for community collaboration. And we, would, we, we really consider this as a as a request for comments on on the terminology uh, because it would be a great addition to the to the entire industry to get onto the same page. We think that this will uh, that, that we will be able to provide this uh, in, a, in a very well documented manner in April, and uh, after a community discussion of, and we, we don't honestly know how long this would take. Uh, after a community discussion of this reference model, uh, we would also uh, provide the technical specification of of or generalized. Uh, GSL, yeah. whereas I, I think that this technical specification should not serve as a design document for the GSL, but it is uh, basically our experience and our knowledge about this topic in the hindsight of already having in implemented a, such a component, uh, and uh, we, we, we give this as a, as a contribution to the community. Um, Why? So, so Tomas, we're, we're at end of job here, and so this has been great. Thank you both, uh, Tomas and Lance, for it. Um, I, I tend to think that, you know, uh, you know we're, we are getting to a point where we do need a coherent reference model that we can all be using to speak the same language. Um, and I think this is ideal. Um, you know, if I'm, I'm hoping that we do get a chance to get together in April. Um, and, uh, you know, I think this would be a great, um, you know, uh, breakout to, to focus on, you know, really sort of going through this and, and um, you know, trying to get some, some agreement um, while we're there face to face. But, you know, the sooner that we can get the reference model uh, published and, and uh, contributed to Rom and the team, I think the, the better. Um, and uh, I, I really look forward to it. So I think uh, yeah, that's thank it. Thank you very much. Yep, we're at uh, 11 o'clock. And so thank you, everybody. Uh, we made it through a very jam-packed agenda. And I want to thank everybody for sticking through it. And um, look forward to talking to you all in the middle of the night next week when I'm in Shanghai. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Good. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Good. Bye.